Hi, this is Nancy Herald, and welcome to my show, High Road to Humanity. In every episode, I tell you powerful true stories filled with great wisdom that you can use in your own life as you strive for a higher road to travel. My featured guests will have their own unique stories to tell that enlighten your mind and your soul. So kick back, relax, and learn the secret to success when you take the high road. Hi, this is Nancy Yerald, and welcome to High Road to Humanity. And guess who's here today? I have Abella Mahaya Carter here today, and her book, I'm going to hold it up, is called Where Do You Hang Your Hammock? And this is a really cool book, great story. Um, this is for people who are wanting to write. Okay, so if you're interested in writing your own book, or if you're a writer and you need some um, really good tips, this is a really fabulous book. Now I've written a book and I gotta tell you, she really covered a lot of material. So we're gonna talk about that today with Bella. But before I bring her on, I just, a couple things I pulled up that is going on with humanity right now. And uh, this is kind of a weird one. I don't even know what to say here. California banned state travel to Florida. So because of the anti-LGBTQ laws, this has really gotten out of hand. California officials have added Florida and four other states to a list of places where state-funded travel is banned over laws that purportedly discriminate against LGBTQ individuals. Now, State Attorney General Rob Bonta, and hopefully I'm not you know, botching his name there, a Democrat announced Monday that Arkansas, Montana, North Dakota, and West Virginia have joined Alabama, Idaho, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, and Texas on the no-go list, which was created in 2016. And, you know, I just want to say this thing has really gone too far because now we're saying people can't go to certain states and it's out of hand. And I'm going to throw my two cents in whether y'all like it or not. I'm a Christian, so I don't believe in all this kind of stuff. I think it's a fad. I think it's people trying to change how our society is, and I don't like it. I love everybody for who they are. I accept everybody for who they are. I don't judge. But when we need to be examples of, of for our children, and I feel like we're not being really good examples, and this stuff is being politicized. And so I just want to say that uh, it just really bothers me that this thing is going on. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'm gonna throw this in here. I was traveling one time and we stopped at a travel, you know, little lodge thing to get gas or whatever. And I went into the bathroom and I was going to the bathroom and I looked and there were these gigantic feet next to me and there were a man's work boots and it freaked me out and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I should say something or if I should just get up and get the heck out of there. And that's pretty much, and then he left. And then I got up and left and then I saw who he was. And I don't know if he made a mistake or what was going on, but I'll tell you what, it's a weird feeling. Um, so for young girls out there who are dealing with this situation, I just want to say, if I was a young girl, it would be a difficult thing because I'm a grown woman and it was a difficult thing for me. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Anyway, so now let's talk about some good news today. So this is really cool, you guys. A trail angel sprinkles good deeds along the Appalachian Trail for unsuspecting hikers. So here we go. Every year, thousands of hikers attempt to complete the 2,000 mile Appalachian Trail stretching from Georgia to Maine, but only one in four are able to conquer the mountainous terrain that has an elevation gain and loss equivalent to hiking, check this out, Mount Everest from sea level and back 16 times. I did not know that. But hikers typically carry only three days worth of food and water. And what they found out is Michelle um, Stodemaker, 
I guess that's her name, has never heard of trail angels or trail magic before her son, Zach, began a through a uh, hike of the Appalachians. And Zach told her how the hikers were so appreciative of the real food that the volunteers, they're nicknamed trail angels, they come and they bring food and water and chairs. And she and her husband, Dave, have become the angels. And I just think this is really cool that people um, take this upon themselves to, uh, to go up there. Of course, they can see the beautiful scenery too. And then they also see what's happening um, and help the hikers out. So I think that's fantastic. So anyway, for all your hikers out there, that was for you. All right. Now, we have a wonderful lady here today. Bella Carter's here. She's a creative writing teacher. She's an empowerment coach. She is a speaker. She's an author. She's an award-winning writer. Uh, her book, Raw, My Journey from Anxiety to Joy, was award-winning. Let's see. She has a collection of narrative poems. She's worked with hundreds of writers since 2008. She has a degree in literature. Welcome, Bella, to High Road to Humanity. Thank you, Nancy. I'm really happy to be here with you today. I'm happy you're here. I read this, and I thought this was really cool. Um, tell the story. How did it come about where you hang your hammock? Okay, well, I tell the story in the introduction to the book, and I will repeat it because many people are curious. They say, what do hammocks have to do with creative writing? Right. Or even with life, for that matter. And, uh, and I just want to say, I love what you said about the trail angels. Mm -hmm. I, feel like, I feel like there are trail angels in my life all the time. And I feel like this story, you know, there's a trail, there's a trail angel at work in this story. So the story is that 10 years ago, my husband and daughter gave me this fabulous Mother's Day gift and it was a hammock yeah. and I loved it, but I didn't know where to put it. Okay. Now I have a pretty decent sized backyard, but I often host literary salons and events back there. And so I didn't want to clutter up that space. And so I thought, where are we going to put this thing? And so we finally decided at the side of the house, there was this um, shed, tool shed, mm -hmm. but there really was any, nothing but junk in the tool shed. So we took the junk out, got rid of it demolished the shed and set up the hammock and it was perfect oh wow it, it was shady and beautiful you know eucalyptus tree just it was gorgeous and so right. you know that was my happy place I every you know during the summer at the end of the day I would go into my hammock I would read I would doze and it was fabulous I loved it cool. and then one day I went out to my hammock something was different what? and not not different in a good way I didn't know what it was, but something was off. I looked up and I realized that the tree limb that provided the shade to my hammock had been cut down by my neighbor. <laughs> now, the tree was on his side of the fence, right. but there was a hole in the fence and the branch went through the hole and then provided this beautiful canopy. Oh, did, oh my gosh, really? And he didn't ask. <laughs> he didn't say anything and it was gone. Now my husband is the nicest person on earth. Okay, talk mm -hmm. about angels. Mm -hmm. so he was like, well, let's plant a tree and that'll provide shade. Oh, like, I love that. <laughs> and I'm like, but you know what? It will take forever for the tree to get big enough for me to have enough shade. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well, let's put a some sort of a shade structure there. And I said, oh no, because then I have to look at something yucky and plastic instead of the sky and the trees. And he kept coming up with these great ideas and I kept shooting them down. Mm -hmm. and finally, my very loving patient husband said, you know what, Bella? I don't really want to hear another word about this hammock. <laughs> you must have really like, but it was your, it was your um, sacred space. It was, it was absolutely yeah. sacred space. Yeah. And I was bummed in the whole summer. I just thought, you know what? My neighbor, he just messed things up for me. I'm screwed. This is terrible. There's no way to fix this. And I dug my heels in and I was just angry. Mm -hmm. At the end of the summer, I was tired one day after working and I thought, you know what? I'm going to see if I can move that hammock. I put on my gardening gloves. I tore down this rotting redwood trellis and I just dragged it a few feet just so that it would be under the shade of a different tree. Mm -hmm. I got in the hammock. I looked up and I thought, this is beautiful. Why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> no, funny. Different and perspective. It, different perspective. I love it. I love well, it. Well, that was just it. You nailed it. I mean, you know, yeah. I had this fixed idea in my mind that the hammock had to be in a certain place, had to look a certain way. And what I learned, what I realized later was that I had a similar experience when I went to go publish my memoir. 
-hmm. I thought that experience had to unfold in a certain way. And when it didn't unfold the way that I expected it to or the way I wanted it to, I had a choice. I could either change my perspective, in other words, move my hammock, mm -hmm. or I could, I could find another way to make it work. Mm -hmm. I, could, I, could, I could take advantage of the opportunities that were right in front of me. Same. It turns out, by the way, that, that I, I now move my hammock all the time. Oh my gosh, how funny. <laughs> I there, love it. And here's the best part. There isn't a bad place in my yard for my hand. So you learned a huge lesson because we get like that. We get like tunnel vision. Well, like, and rigid. I don't know where that comes from, but we do get like that. Don't we? That's yeah. That's really crazy. Well, you know, I just want to say this was a really good, good book um, for writers. And I'm going to go through some of it if that's okay with you, because I mean, this book wasn't just for people who write you guys. And if you're writing, this is a good one. It was for people who are looking to expand their spirituality, I feel. Um, how did you get, because I will say, not just moving your hammock got you to this point, because you know a lot. And I realized that as I read your book. First of all, you say, uh, tell your story. Well, I tell, you tell your story, but then you tell people uh, before they start to write, who do you think you are? Observe your thoughts. Talk about that. Yeah. Oh, I love talking to you, Nancy. Thank you. I like talking to you too. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, for many, many years, I thought I was who society told me I was. Yeah. I thought I was my mother's daughter. You know, I thought I was my husband's wife. I thought I was, I thought that my identity had to do with the house that I lived in, the car that I drive the education that I had, um, what I was able to accomplish for a long time. I thought that my worth, that I had to prove myself. And mm -hmm. I'll even go as far as to say that I thought that if I wasn't outstanding, I didn't deserve to exist. Like I was constantly striving and pushing and, right. you know, jumping through hoops and trying to prove that I belonged here. Mm -hmm. A lot of us do that, you know? Yeah. I did that too. I did that in real estate. When I got into real estate, I had to prove something. I don't know why, but continue on because that's yeah. not what it's about. Yeah. So this is, so all of that is conditioned thought that at some point when we were young, very, very young, we learned these things mm -hmm. because we needed them to protect us in some way. And, but, but the truth is that we are none of those things, right? We are spiritual beings having a human experience. We are all equally worthy. Mm -hmm. There is no competition. There is no need to prove ourselves because we're all the same. We're made of the same Society stuff. Society did this though, huh, Bella? Well, I really feel like that. I really feel like that because you went in and you do what I ask everybody to do, go within and you went inside and you realize that's where the treasure was, not on the outside of proving yourself, right? Did you, did you, did I talk about my treasure dream in this book? No, but I just know that. <laughs> okay. I, but you I'm can tell say, us, you I can tell us. Things. Yeah. So for years I had this dream. The dream was I'm living in this mansion so that my house is much larger than I thought it was. Okay. And it is filled with treasures I didn't know I had. Okay. And in my treasure dream, there were always three very special and sacred rooms. One of them was a library with floor to ceiling books, just okay. all the books I could ever want to read. Okay. And one of them, I come from a dance background. So right. one of them was just a beautiful open dance studio. And it was this mansion overlooking the sea, right? And another was a gold encrusted um, chapel. So there was prayer, there was movement, and there was study, body, mind, and spirit. It right. was all there. And, and you dreamed it. And you dreamed it. I this. dreamed it. I hey, dreamed it. I, I'm going to have to stop you because we have to go to commercial break. And we'll, you guys are going to have to wait till we come back. You guys, this is Nancy Yearout. I'm here today with Bella Mahaya Carter. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. Where do you hang your hammock? Finding peace of mind while you write, publish, and promote your book. This is Nancy Yearout. This is High Road to Humanity. And we will be right back. 
Hi, it's Nancy Yerolt. This is High Road to Humanity. I'm here today with Bella Mahaya Carter. Finish your story. I'm sorry I had to stop you. We were way over on our time. Yeah, no problem. The point of the story is this. I just had this recurring dream that my house is bigger than I thought and filled with treasures I didn't know I had. And now looking back on that dream, I, it was a recurring dream. I had it for many years. Um, I as realized- As a child or as an adult? As an as adult? As an adult. Okay. As a person trying to write, as a person trying to create, but I've had a lot of, um, I also had prison dreams. Oh, whoa. And, and I had them at the same time that I had that dream. So I had the treasure dreams and the prison dreams. And um, I'll give you an example of a prison dream. I'm okay. standing in a prison. Okay. I'm, my hands are clutching the bars. Right. And I look to my right and I realize there's nothing but wilderness there. And I look, this was when I was toward the end of the prison dreams. Yeah. This is when I was about to get free. Okay. And then I looked to the left and there was nothing but wilderness. I craned my head. I looked all around me and I realized that I was surrounded by wilderness and I'm clutching the bars. And I asked the question, you know, how do I get, how do I get out of here? How do you get free? Yeah. And the, and the, and there was a voice that said, let go, let go. And I woke up wiggling my fingers. And I had one more dream about letting go a few years later when I was in a really, really hard time in my life. And the dream was that I'm driving on the freeway mm -hmm. and I'm about to go into the off ramp and the steering wheel comes off in my hands. Oh my gosh. And I think, oh shit, I'm gonna crash. <laughs> and then I realize that I'm not crashing, that my car, my, the, the vehicle that is my life is being driven by something greater than me. And I can just let go. It's hard, isn't it? You really, I have to tell you something. By reading your book, I did get that. And I'm glad that you that you wrote this um, because it makes people realize what's really important and that we're not in charge. I can tell because I'm an intuitive that you are a control freak. Yes. And I'm sure you'll admit that to me and to the audience because I, I can just pick that up. Absolutely. And I used to be the same thing, I think way, thinking you can control everything. And it's really hard a lot of times to let go and let, they say, let go and let God, and you hear that, but to actually do it is another thing, isn't it? You know, it's so funny because, uh, because of this book, I've been invited to give some talks and I've been thinking about what are the three main things I want to communicate to people. Mm -hmm. And the first one was slow down, which is, which is. Um, what I was talking about thought, the speed of thought, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we actually, our minds move so fast that we're not living our lives. We're living our thoughts. We're just right. like, we're being hijacked by our thoughts. And so there's that. Mm -hmm. And the second piece was uh, the messages that I've gotten in my meditation practice and in my prayer practice have been stop fighting, let go. Like those have been strong messages. Mm -hmm. and, but then what I realized is that that's sort of all under the umbrella of surrender. Mm -hmm. and I've also gotten that message, surrender, surrender, surrender. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so much to surrender. You know, there's the doubt, there's the fear, there's the, 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 the illusion of control because we don't ever actually have control. We have the illusion of control. Yeah, we do. And it's funny that, yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, when you do let go though, and kind of relax, things come to you. And I don't know how to say this. You have to pay attention to what comes to you, but you can't control what comes to you and what right. doesn't. Right. You have to meet it. You have to welcome it, even when it's stuff that you don't like. And it's and how you handle it. It's how you handle it. It's it's totally how you handle it. It's not yeah. what happens. It's your response to what happens. Yeah. You know, when people write, you say there's a lot of um, self-doubt. Um, and we were just talking about that. You're not good enough. I have nothing valuable to say. I'm afraid my writing won't, will hurt people. That really hit home for me because when I wrote my book, I had to be honest and say what really happened. And it kind of made my, one of my family members upset. And that's hard to do. But if you're going to do it, I guess I should say you should be honest. And you say, uh, you go on to say, which is what we're talking about, the present moment is our point of power. It's the moment when we are free to act. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny. I'm listening to you. I, I like listening to you. I listen to your show and I really enjoy your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. And 
And it's fun to hear you read what I wrote because oftentimes I'll, I'll open this book at late at night and I'll just, just do a random page and I'll read it and I'll feel inspired and I'll feel like, oh, yeah. well, I didn't really write it. Honestly, I feel like the book came through me. It did. Yeah. <laughs> it did. Can I address that? Is that okay if I say something? Yes, else? please do. I want to talk about this because, and I thought about you when I was reading this, when I wrote my book, and it's a long time ago, I need to write a new one, you guys. But when I wrote Wake Up, the Universe is Speaking to You, and I told my story, it was about 2014, I wrote it. And um, when I realized that it wasn't me writing it, is when I would write something, and then the next day I would write it again. And I would think, wait a minute, I wrote that already. And then I realized after a while, this isn't coming from me. This is coming from a higher power because things are coming through that I wouldn't have known and things are coming through repeatedly. Like, this is what you're supposed to write. Did you experience that? Yeah, you know, sometimes we're not listening. I know. <laughs> Yeah. I remember I had, there was a period like 10 years ago when I had five books in my file cabinet and I felt like a failure and I didn't know which book to pursue. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and I got really quiet. And the question that I sat with was what, what book should I write next? Mm -hmm. And the answer was very clear. The answer was, it doesn't matter. Just pick one project and follow it through to completion. Okay. And I, my response was like, but, but like, but which one? And again, you know, the voice just said, it doesn't matter. You're not listening. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I think so much of the work that I do with writers and with myself is um, I help people get out of their own way. Yes. So that what wants to come through them is yes. free to come because we get in our own way with all of our thinking, all that thought. I'm not good enough. Who cares what I have to say? All that thinking, that's not the truth of who we are. Mm -mm. That's our conditioned mind trying it's to- It's our program. Us. It's our program is what exactly. it is. It's a program. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know what I like um, about what you teach people about writing? And you guys, I want you to hear me say this because I want you to understand this. She is telling you that you have to go within and that the writing comes from your heart and your soul and through the divine. And when you do that, and I think that's your message through a lot of this, she's teaching you through this book why it's important that you come from the heart. You say what you feel, you say what's in your heart. It doesn't matter what other people think. Apparently that message has to get out. And that's what's, that's what makes a really good book. I, I will say with that piece about it doesn't matter what other people think. I just want to qualify that a little bit. And that is... <laughs> okay that is to say you know like for example I don't write anything about a love like I, I write a lot of stuff okay mm -hmm. and I write what I need to write in my journal whatever right. when it's time to go from being a writer to being an author when it's time to share what I write and publish what I write if I'm writing stuff that involves a loved one I'm not just going to go ahead and publish that without their permission you know, I published a poetry book called Secrets of My Sex when I was a young woman. And it was all about my sex life, basically. Well, I that's a different kind of subject. Yeah. <laughs> kind of subject. But, yeah. But, but the point was, I was trying to give voice to, I was trying to speak and, and, and set myself free, basically. Right. right. So it was and your so way of expressing It was yourself. my way of, of freeing myself, you know, from some things that happened to me when I was young making sense out of my life, trying to find my voice. That's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I wouldn't publish anything that my husband was, wasn't okay with, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't publish anything about my daughter or my, you know, my family, you know, unless now there are some cases where people need to do that and they need to, but I guess what I'm trying to say is writing is one thing and publishing is another. Yeah. And I encourage people to write whatever needs to be expressed through them, whatever needs to be written. Right. When it comes to publishing, then, you know, and, and between the time that you write something and the time that it's published, unless you're blogging and that just happens very quickly, there's usually, there could be years. So there, a lot of things change and there are ways to publish, there are ways to publish something 
there are just ways to deal with that. And so I just tell writers, when you're writing is not the time to think about what other people are going to think about what you're writing. Well, and I guess I'll address that really quick. When I wrote my book, I talked about um, a failed marriage. And, um, and, I, and that's what upset my daughter was that uh, she was like, oh, but you talked about my dad. Well, it was a failed marriage. You can't, and what I'm saying is you can't change how things are. I'm not going to make it rosier than what it was. I tell the truth and Absolutely. people, and what I think is, I'll just throw my two cents in here. I think people need to know the truth, you yeah. know, uh, instead of making it rose color or, or, a way that it really wasn't the truth will set you free <laughs> that's what i always think but yeah you do have to be careful and you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings but on the flip side when you got to tell your story you got to tell your story absolutely and, and unapologetically unapologetically yes that's what i'm trying to say i think more than need, anything you didn't need your daughter's permission to tell your story because you right. actually own your story and your story is your story that's what I was trying to say with this, yes. Hey, this is Nancy Earl. This is High Road to Humanity. I'm here today with Bella Mahaya Carter. Her book is called, Where Do You Hang Your Hammock? And this is High Road to Humanity. We'll be right back. This is High Road to Humanity. I'm here today with Bella Mahaya Carter. We're having a wonderful conversation about writing. And, um, you know, there's so many different things I want to talk about uh, that you talk about in the book. You talk about... Um, let me just move on here a little bit. I love this part. You talk about social media. Tell your story about Facebook. I really like this because I ran into this, you know, where you, you want to put yourself out there and at first you don't have friends and then you get friends and tell your, tell your Facebook story. I, I think it's interesting. I love it. You're such a good interviewer. I mean, nobody has asked me this question. You know, I've had lots well, of- Well, it hit home, man. I was like, I remember. Go I love it. And actually there were, there are two stories about that. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, before I tell those stories, I just want to say that uh, self-promotion is something that we, we cringe at, you know, especially as women. Like, I don't know about you, but for me, it was like, don't be a show off, you know, when I was- Oh yeah. Class. Yes. Right. Don't be a show off, you know, and I was just like, I was living in the exuberance of life and doing what I love to do. And so to be accused of being a show off, you know, under those circumstances as a three-year-old or a four-year-old, yeah, it, it's hurtful, you know. Yeah. And, be seen and not heard. Did you hear that one? Oh, all the time. Yeah. So children, yes, children so, are to be seen so and not heard. About, you know, there's like a delicate line. You know, I actually just yesterday I had I had sent an article to, to a woman at this magazine and she said, well, you know, it's a little bit too self-promotional <laughs> as a, I'm as sorry. a, no, it's, I mean, it's funny because it really kind of pushed my, like, well, why bit. else would you be right? I mean, <laughs> and as a memoirist, I kind of share my own stories so that people can, understand, like see themselves reflected in my story. It's not that I want you to see me. It's that I want, like, I'm being transparent. I'm showing you where I'm weak and vulnerable so that you can maybe identify and see where you might be. Man, Bella, you hit it. I got to say something. I had somebody say something nasty to me yesterday on YouTube. They're like, I wish the interviewer would just be quiet. And I'm like, really? Don't you realize that I'm having a conversation here and I'm sharing my world with you so you guys get it? That's what I do. And you're exactly right. That's what we do. We're sharing our heart. We're exposing ourselves so that we help other people. It's exactly. And so here's what I realized yesterday when I got that message. Mm -hmm. And also I had, there were the two stories that I talked about in my book with the Facebook where I got sort of similar messages. I got criticized in a, in a public way. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was just like in my book where I had that chapter about universal doubt, and I say, like, this is not personal. I realize, like, these comments, you know, these are like something is being triggered in this person, or like they're having, they have their own agenda, job, whatever. And they have a right to their opinion. And so I noticed that things got really interesting when I was willing to listen to what they said and not take it personally and actually see it maybe, okay, so maybe there's some course correction here for me. So like with that editor, I was like, oh, I could see how she could see what I was doing as, as self-promotional. So I'm going to cut back now. Like on the next article, I sent, I sent her an article, I sent her another article right away. And I actually looked at it through the lens of how could this be perceived as self-promotion? And I actually tweaked it a little bit. 
And, you know, she published it immediately. And I didn't mind because I, like my first reaction though, don't get me wrong, was like, I felt hurt and I felt triggered and I felt mm-hmm. defensive. Like I had to justify and defend myself. But it's, but then I realized, no, I don't have to. And no, you don't like, have to. Can I say I something now, to. Bella? I got to tell you, this is just driving me nuts here. <laughs> I'm going to say <laughs> most of the time and 99% of the time it's their insecurities. Right. Right. And sometimes, you know, and sometimes, and sometimes there's something to be learned from it. And like, that's okay, fine. I'll, that's fine. I'll, I'll yeah. this story because it was really interesting. So okay. I did spell. So I'm not a great speller. I never have been. Me and either. I'm for Marion, you know, I help, I'm like a midwife of stories, right? I help people get to like, get to the juicy stuff, but I'm not a copy editor. I don't know, you know, like whatever. I have a great respect for language and the tools of my trade, but. Right. uh, So I misspelled the word shining. And I said something like, you know, if we, I don't remember exactly what it was, something about shining our lights, right? Right. And I spelled it shining, (laughs) S-H-I-N-N-I-N-G, two N's instead of one. And so this copy editor, you know, said something kind of mean, like, well, if I'm gonna, you know, she just, she, she found it offensive, especially since I promote, you know, myself as someone who helps writers. And at first, you know, that was not nice. That's not nice, Bella. It wasn't nice, but here's the thing. She, you know, talk about acceptance, uh, you know, accepting the human condition, right? Here Mm -hmm. she is. She's, you know, I don't know where to go with this because I can go in a lot of different directions, but I'm going to just trust. I'm going to listen to where I need to go here. Okay. So when, so at first I was, I was hurt. I was defensive. I felt the need to justify, defend, explain. And then I just said, wait, stop, come back, come back from all that thinking and be in your loving, Mm -hmm. be in your loving. Well, she was judging you. It's true. That's the problem. That was but the it thing. Happened, it happens all the time. So, but here's the thing, you know, yeah. and I actually got I somebody, I've gotten great reviews from this book. Um, I've gotten a couple of reviews that like just like two. So within a great review, somebody said, I disagree with how she handled the Facebook thing because I just don't even, I don't even uh, interact with anybody who's trolling or criticizing or you know, like that. So she thought I shouldn't have answered at all, but I actually felt like I felt an inner uh, desire to Mm -hmm. show up in a way that was loving. And that created a loving exchange. She actually ended up coming back and saying to me like, oh, I'm so glad you didn't take my comment personally. And she said, I'm sorry, it was a snarky comment and I'm sorry you didn't take it personally. And you know what? She realized it was yeah, but she, she realized it was she said, I have a book that I would like help with. Maybe you, you're the one to help me with it. Yeah. So it's so, how you react is what you're trying to say. It's that, how you that, react. And if we stop taking things so personally and we realize like when somebody attacks us, well, you know, maybe it's about them and not about us. That's and what maybe, I think. And maybe yeah. if we show up, but we don't want to judge them either. Right, right, right. right. We don't want to dismiss them. And in the case of you've got an editor who has a point of view, I honestly believe that that editor, she was protecting the interests of her readers. And she had an objective, an objective perspective that I lacked because I was in it. I was writing it. Right. And so I, as an editor, you know, if I'm sending her work, I'm going to respect her opinion and I'm going to, and I'm going to listen to what she has to say. Right. Hey, I want to bring up a couple more things that are really important because I wrote and I want to talk about self-publishing. I want to talk about getting a publicist and what that's all like, because it's not easy. A lot of us, you know, you can write this book and think it, it's my baby. And then, you know, a lot of people just go ahead and self-publish and then they wonder why it didn't do well. Some people get a publicist and hope that it does well. Do you want to address that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that most people have no idea what's involved with writing and publishing a book. So that's the first thing. Mm-hmm. And and what it takes to sell a book. Yeah. The advice that I get, so so there are more opportunities today to publish than ever before. And self-publishing has just be, has become an absolutely legitimate way to publish. There are hybrid publishers. That's what I did. I went with She Writes Press, which is a hybrid publisher. And there are certain standards for what what hybrid publishing means. 
And I guess what I would say to, to listeners today is make sure that your book is the best that it can be. Because, you know, and that means hiring, if you don't have the money, launch a crowdfunding campaign, which people do in the music industry, very, you know, have been doing it for years in the film industry, and people are starting to now do it, doing it, do it in the book industry. Make sure your book, so it's just, so this, here's the basic editorial um, situation. So you write a book and then you, you know, you work with somebody outside you, right. preferably a, a develop, let's say a developmental editor mm-hmm. who will read the book with an eye toward, um, you know, the story is, you know, are there holes? Is there, are there redundancies? Is, does the story make sense? Mm-hmm. You know, so looking at the big picture of the storytelling, that's right. the first step and that's developmental editing. After developmental editing, once the story is all working and the pieces are in place and there's not redundancy and, and big holes in your story or your narrative, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. then it goes to a copy editor. Right. So a copy editor is going to look at the grammar, the usage, and that kind of thing. And, and then after that, it goes to a proofreader or, or multiple proofreaders to make sure mm-hmm. there aren't any typos, misspellings, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. So it, it, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna publish a book and you're and you don't have a traditional deal, that's fine. But make sure that your book is can compete in the marketplace and is professionally done. And right. that also would include if you're doing it self publishing, um, you know, a professional book designer because yes. books really do. Book covers are important. I mean, you really can. Uh, many books are are sold based on their cover and their title. Exactly, exactly. Hey, I want to talk more about this when we come back from commercial break. Hey, you guys, I'm here today with Bella Mahaya Carter. Her book is called Where Do You Hang Your Hammock? Here it is, you guys. And they can pick it up on Amazon or how do they get in touch with you, Bella? Uh, My website is www.bellamahayacarter.com. Awesome. And you guys, if you want a psychic reading, I always remind you, go to my website, go to my calendar, you click on book and it'll take you to my calendar and you can book a time with me. Okay. We will be back in a few minutes. This is Nancy Earl. This is High Road to Humanity. And I'll see you in a minute. Hi, this is Nancy Earl. This is High Road to Humanity. I'm here today with Bella Mahaya Carter. Bella, this is really um, good advice that you're given. And the the best advice that you just gave was to have somebody edit your book and go through it. And I had, I, I want to tell my story a little bit. I had two people edit my book. The first lady, um, we just didn't get along. It was, and you, you know, and I didn't expect it. It was one of those things where everything she, I mean, she was poking at me and poking at the book. And I was like, oh, and so I ended up having to get a different person halfway through and that happens. And I just want to say that to you guys, if the person you're working with, if you two don't jive, then I move on. It's okay. Move on to the next person because we just didn't click. We just didn't click at all. The next lady who did my book, man, she and I just clicked. She got me. She understood. Like the other lady just didn't get me. And it was nothing personal. And it cost me a little bit of extra money to hire somebody different, but I did it. And that's why, because it became a miserable situation and I didn't want that. So I just want to throw that out there. I had a similar experience with my, with my second book with my publicist. Really? Yeah, I went to, to great lengths to research and talk to people and I chose somebody and, and three months into the book, into the uh, campaign, I was clear that it wasn't working and I switched mid campaign and it was a really good decision. Yeah. I wanted to say two things about what you just said. Uh, working with editors is, is, is an art and a skill in itself. And I just wrote a blog post this week. It's posted on my website called Six Tips for Meaningful Collaborations. Mm-hmm. It's super important who you choose and how you work with people. And um, I agree with you. If, you, if you, the person that you have picked, no matter how much due diligence you did to pick them, right. doesn't work out, don't be proud, just make a change. Yeah, because I didn't, you know, she was recommended and I had paid her and I didn't want to, you know, right. rock the boat, but but it wasn't a pleasant experience. The other thing I want to say, um, and I don't really like to, t- well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you guys something that I did and it worked for me. So I'm just going to share this. So if you hear it, you're a lucky person. I, um, I got my book out there and I sent it to Barnes and Noble and I said, I want you to put my book in your, you know, out there. And they did. 
And I just want to say that because, and I feel blessed that they did, they liked my book, but if you don't try, and this is what you talk about, if you don't ask, and I want you to talk about this, if you don't ask, you don't get. So talk about that. Yeah, there's a chapter in my book called Ask for What You Want. And if you want to read the chapter for free, you can go to my website, go to the press page and go down to Jane Friedman. She's a writing guru, wonderful, wonderful woman and um, so helpful for writers. And she actually published that chapter in its entirety on her blog. Yeah. So it's Ask for What You Want in the Jane, Jane Friedman's blog. And I think the reason why she picked that chapter to publish is because I write about a, a story, I write a story about my old writing teacher who I noticed was promoting somebody else's teaching. Oh, and okay. I thought, gee, I wonder if he has an email list of thousands. And I and I thought, well, gee, I, you know, I have a new workshop coming up. I wonder if he'd promote my workshop. Mm -hmm. And I put email Jack on my to-do list for a week every day and it wasn't getting done. Yeah. And I didn't know why it wasn't getting done. And then finally, in my journal, I did some digging. And I discovered that I had this belief that I shouldn't need to ask for help. That not only shouldn't I need to ask for help, but doing so was shameful. Oh. Yeah. I felt ashamed because I felt like if I had all my shit together, I don't know if I can say that on the air, but I think yeah, you can. <laughs> It's um, my show. You could say it. It's okay. <laughs> all right. So I thought if I didn't have all my shit together and I couldn't just do this perfectly and be, you know, just completely outstanding all by myself with no help from anybody else, then I was failing. No. And that, and that no. belief was just a crazy belief. It just was a thought that had no bearing in the truth. We are, we live in community. We work in community we depend on one another all the time and people love to help other people mm -hmm. i love to help people that's why i do what i do i love seeing people who feel stuck move move on and express Forward. themselves yeah. yeah so so that's that chapter talked about the importance of feeling free to ask for what you want yeah. Well, I just thought it was really good. Well, yeah, you say, um, you also say in the book, ditch your good girl or good boy shame. And that's what you're talking about here, you know, and I think that's really good. Also at the end, you, you give eight tips for using video to promote your book and your business. And that really hit home with me uh, completely. And I'll tell you why real quick, because I, I did the podcast right after I did my book and let me rewind. I wrote my book and I'm like you, you know, I wanted everybody to read it they need to know this information and it's really important and I got to get it out there, but it didn't get out there as much as I wanted to. So then I did the podcast and I'm like, it's still not getting out there. And I'm a visual person. And that's when I decided to start doing YouTube because I think people are visual and maybe they're like me and maybe I needed to speak to them in a different way. So also, talk about, yeah, yeah, I love but, that you're bringing this up. Also, the well, yeah. One thing to keep in mind is that even books that are traditionally published, mm -hmm. I don't, don't quote me on these numbers, but, and Brooke Warner talks about it in Write On Sisters. Um, I don't remember the subtitle offhand, but, but um, we have this idea that, that it's easy to sell thousands of books. Yeah. But, but most books, you know, you're lucky, like, in traditional publishing, you know, you're lucky if you sell a few hundred books, hundreds, yeah. not thousands. Exactly. Now, I do know people who have done some amazing work and sold thousands of books, but I know many, 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 many more authors who have sold hundreds of books. And I feel that that is an accomplishment. Right. If you can sell hundreds of books. God bless you. I mean, right. that, that's an accomplishment. And it's, and it's not the numbers. Of books that you sell it's just it's how are you living your life and how are you being of service and how are you helping right and how are you contributing to conversations that inspire and uplift people so you felt the video would be more you, you felt like i did the same thing that video would get your message out there yeah i mean video is just a part of what uh, is another tool that's available to us and it's a powerful tool mm -hmm. and and I don't really think an author can promote a book these days. I mean, well, I shouldn't say that. 
what I say to people, because there's a whole section on promotion in the book. Right. And I say, show up, do what you enjoy doing. Don't try to do it all. Mm -hmm. And then I would also say, however, growth really does come when you're willing to step out of your comfort zone. And if you're not, and really, I, I think I wrote that chapter for people that aren't familiar with video and how it works. And, and so I just mentioned really practical things. Mm -hmm. I actually don't even remember what I wrote in the chapter, but, so funny. <laughs> but, um, but I probably wrote things like, you know, <laughs> consider the frame you know like I went to film school right I have a master's in math. oh I didn't know that you didn't tell us that yeah I have an MFA in filmmaking from USC oh my god so okay. like consider the frame like look at the frame yeah okay, look at where I am right now okay do you mm -hmm. think this is an accident this shot like I have a poster of my book I have a little flower I have books in the background yeah you know it's not arbitrary I didn't right. just you know turn on the camera in my kitchen with you know my refrigerator filled with stuff or whatever right, like, it was thought out it was thought, thought out right? right right there's thought to what i'm wearing right you no know, it's all thought out there's costume there's set mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so so i tried to help people understand what what are the things that they could be thinking about as right. they go about trying to promote their books on video Right. No, I think that's wonderful. I think it's fantastic because yeah, um, that's really what's helped me and get my message out. And that's been my biggest success is to talk to people and just be myself and tell them what I feel and all these things that I talk about in my book. Now I can share with them on video. And so that's good, you know? All right. So tell us some more stories. You have a couple really good stories in here. Any, there was one about white roses, as I recall. Oh yeah. Oh, that. Yeah. Um, you should know that, like, I have a crummy memory, which is why I write things down all the time. Okay, me too. It's okay. So, they <laughs> might, I might get some of the details wrong, but I, I usually get the big pieces right. Okay. And, and the reason, like, in my book, like, believe what you read in my book over what I tell you, because the stuff in my book comes from my writing. See, I well, write it came down. I write yeah. in my journal. Well, I'm just saying, like, I write in my journal when things happen, you know, yeah. like, stories that happen. I write in my journal and then they sometimes turn into blog posts. And then like this book was created with, with 10 years worth of blog posts. So uh, sometimes I get the stories wrong, but yeah, it was, it was a, just a really hard time. I don't remember what was happening in the world at that time, but I remember it was a very challenging time and right. people were really down. It was before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was like the election, you know, craziness that was going on. Right. But, um, my daughter said, you know, I really, I wish we could do something nice for people. Mm -hmm. And we decided to go to this like wholesale florist and we bought, I think two dozen white roses mm -hmm. and we came home and we wrapped them all up individually into like one rose. And my daughter likes to do calligraphy and she wrote this, she wrote some lovely message. Like, I hope you have a lovely day. Yeah. 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 And we went down to the main, to Ventura Boulevard. I live in Studio City. And so it's like the main thoroughfare in our city. Right, right. And we went, like, we parked in front of Starbucks and we just gave people roses. We just handed them out. We said, would you like a rose? We're just giving them away. And it was funny because <laughs> there were some people that were really grateful and they said, oh, thank you so much. You know, and then there were other people who were suspicious and said, well, why are you doing this? <laughs> and then there were other people that would be like, you know, would, wouldn't even look at us like as if we were handing them like a leaflet, like a, to promote something, you know, so it was really interesting. And, yeah. um, but the thing that I took away from it was, was, were the people who, you know, who said things like, oh, like a young man who said, oh, my girlfriend loves white roses. I can't wait to give this to her. Thank you oh, so much. Wow. That's really cool. I thought that was a really good story. And I thought that was something um, really neat. Hey, tell everybody how they can get in touch with you if they would like for you to help them with their writing. Well, it's just start by visiting my website. It's www.bellamahiacarter.com. And um, people, if, when you visit my website, you get a free gift if you sign up for 10 ways to nurture yourself while writing, which is a oh, beautiful, wow. beautiful piece. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and then you can just see, see my offerings. I do have, uh, some summer classes coming up the week after next. So if people are interested in doing some deep, deep work, uh, spiritually, emotionally, psycholo psychologically, and, uh, in the literary sense, then 
please contact me, reach out as soon as you can. And uh, I'd be happy to hear from you. All right, fantastic. I'm really glad you came on the show today. Really fabulous book, you guys. You need to pick this one up if you're going to write. Where do you hang your hammock? And it's by Bella Mahaya Carter. Bella, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Nancy. It's been so much fun. It's a pleasure. Hey, you guys, this is Nancy Earl. This is High Road to Humanity, and we will see you next time. Everybody take care. Bye-bye. Connect the dots keep the motion. Can achieve your goal. Let's hit the high road. Hey, you guys, join me next week on The High Road for more stories filled with wisdom, love, and hope for our future. Have a fabulous week and know that by staying on The High Road, you will make it to your destination. Visit my website, nancyyearout.com, where you can book a private session to learn how to tap into your own abilities. And check out my YouTube channel. It's Nancy Yearout's High Road to Humanity. If you can achieve your goal.